Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. The Mauna Loa Observatory sits on the side of a Hawaiian volcano, 11,000 feet above the Pacific. And for nearly 60 years, an instrument there has been sniffing the local air, taking a census of carbon dioxide molecules. In that time, CO2 levels have steadily risen from about 315 parts per million to 405. And plants are enjoying the extra carbon. It's kind of obvious that plants are going to react to CO2 in the atmosphere because it, it, it changes the environment which they're bathed in. Ralph Keeling, a geochemist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And it's very hard for the plants not to, to benefit from that by having a higher water use efficiency. But what, what wasn't clear is just how much more efficient they were going to be. So what's water use efficiency? Like us, plants need water for basic life processes, and they open tiny pores in their leaves to allow carbon dioxide in for photosynthesis. But the holes also let the precious water out. Higher water use efficiency just means losing less water while taking in the CO2. To figure out just how much the efficiency improves, Keeling and his team examine the ratio of CO2 having the isotope carbon-13 versus its lighter and much more prevalent cousin, carbon-12. So the ratio is 0.2% lower than it was pre-industrially. Doesn't sound like a lot, does it? And yet, that small change in carbon-13 versus carbon-12 allowed Keeling and his colleagues to quantify just how much more efficiently plants are sipping water in a higher CO2 regime. And it turns out their water use efficiency rises right in step with CO2 levels. If you dial that back to how much CO2 has gone up since pre-industrial times, you're talking about something like a 40% increase in carbon dioxide overall, and therefore a 40% increase in some measure of water use efficiency. So it's, it's no small change. The studies in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. As we flood the atmosphere with more CO2 and average global temperatures rise, some areas of the planet are getting wetter. But other spots face a drier future, where this water-sipping innovation might be a lifesaver. Unfortunately, there's no evidence that in a hotter future, we humans will naturally use water more efficiently, too. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. One of the consequences of a warming world is that high mountain habitats, which used to be too chilly for trees, are heating up. There is now sort of newly available real estate for trees above what we call tree line. You know, this sort of literal line in the sand above which trees just can't grow because it's too cold. But now it's not. Brian Smithers is an ecologist at UC Davis, and he compares this slow-moving migration to land grabs back in pioneer times. You know, they fired the guns and all the settlers just made a mad dash to claim their stake. It's that, but, you know, if everybody were crawling on their bellies or something like that instead. Smithers is studying this upslope race among bristlecone pines. These trees can live for more than 5,000 years, making them the oldest individual organisms on Earth. Many of them eke out a living in dry, rocky soils on wind-blown ridgelines around 11,000 feet in eastern California and Nevada. They look like the worst bonsai tree imaginable. I mean, it, they, can, they just look gnarled and twisted, uh, something that looks like it's taken a beating for 5,000 years and still living. So as tree line rises, these giant bonsais are following. But Smithers says the ancient trees now have a competitor, a species called limber pine. The limbers are passing the bristlecones at tree line, sprouting seedlings in that fresh real estate up slope more quickly. Quickly being a relative term here. It's the tortoise and the, and the slightly faster tortoise. Smithers documents the race in the journal Global Change Biology. The leapfrogging limber pines could put bristlecones in a bind, hemmed in by competing seedlings upslope and hotter temperatures downslope. And that, Smithers says, would have long-lasting consequences. You know, we talk about the effects of climate change happening on on scales of 100 years. You know, what's going to happen by 2100? But in 5,000 years, someone will be able to go to this stand and say, oh, it looks like this because people made climate change happen 5,000 years ago. You know, it just changes the scale when we talk about the effects of climate change. Assuming, that is, we humans stick around long enough to notice. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata.
To study the heavens, it's all about the photons. We in astronomy are always greedy. We want every photon that we can collect. Drew Phillips, astronomer at the University of California Observatories. More photons, he says, basically means more science about incredibly faint, distant objects. And that's where the optics problem comes in. Because incoming light reflects off several mirrors before it comes out the business end of a telescope. And mirrors aren't perfectly reflective. The traditional mirror coating, aluminum, reflects only about 90% of light. Bounce that light around a few times in a telescope, and you lose valuable photons. The throughput, the actual number of photons that are detected in the end in a modern spectrograph, you're doing good if you get 30%. So you want the most reflective material for your mirrors, like silver, which reflects 97 to 99 percent of visible and infrared light, respectively. Big improvement over aluminum. But silver's got its problems, too. It is finicky. It's subject to tarnish and oxidation and corrosion. So Phillips and his team have borrowed a trick from the computer industry called atomic layer deposition. The technique allows them to take a silver-coated mirror and coat it with extremely uniform layers of transparent aluminum oxide to protect against corrosion. And unlike the small-scale atomic deposition used in the electronics industry, this new machine, recently installed in a lab at UC Santa Cruz, is scaled up to coat mirror segments up to a meter in diameter, meaning you could coat all 500 mirrors of a state-of-the-art telescope, like the planned 30-meter telescope, in a matter of months. When put to use, these better mirrors might allow astronomers to capture more photons and shed more light, literally, on faraway galaxies and stars. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. In 1869, the Smiley family purchased a parcel of land about 100 miles north of New York City. Over time, some of their property and much of the surrounding landscape became the Mohonk Preserve, which has since grown to 8,000 acres and attracts droves of visitors to its thick forests and rugged crags popular among rock climbers. But the Mohawk Preserve also has a long scientific legacy. In the 1930s, Dan Smiley, a descendant of the original owners, began keeping track of the plants and animals that lived in the area. He wrote meticulous notes on the backs of menus from the Mohonk Mountain House, a resort owned by his family. He would take these old menus, and because he was green, he was an environmentalist, so he would cut up these menus into squares, and actually on the back of all of our index cards, or you can see parts of the menu from back in the 1920s and 1930s, so you can see what was served for dinner that night. Megan Napoli, a research ecologist with the Mohonk Preserve in New York. Smiley's efforts produced a rare long-term data set of observations. It's ideal for studying the impacts of climate change, which often play out over the course of many decades and cause subtle changes in the timing of natural processes. For instance, other research has shown that songbirds are migrating north earlier and earlier in the spring. The reason that it's important that the birds arrive at the proper time in the spring is because they need to time their arrival with the insect emergence. So they need to be here to establish their territories, establish their nesting sites, lay their eggs, and then once the eggs hatch and they have their nestlings, they need to time that when the insects are most abundant. Napoli has begun analyzing roughly 76,000 observations of songbird migration dates collected by Smiley and his team to see if they too show that climate change has altered the timing of migrations. Her preliminary results suggest that they do. Napoli found that short-distance migrants that spend their winters in the southern U.S. now arrive an average of 11 days earlier than they did in the 1930s, Long-distance migrants that overwinter in the tropics arrive roughly a week earlier. Napoli presented her results at a recent Ecological Society of America meeting in Portland, Oregon. As in previous studies, Napoli also found a correlation between early arrivals and rising spring temperatures at Mohonk, which the Smiley family has been tracking since 1896. But she says there are still more questions about how and why the birds are migrating earlier, and Smiley's data may hold more clues. Meanwhile, who knows how many other long-term personal data collections like Smiley's are out there waiting to be discovered and to help bolster official attempts to track the planet's changes. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. In the frog world, romance is often accompanied by a song. It's the norm. The vast majority of frogs have males calling to attract females. Sandra Gute is an evolutionary biologist and herpetologist at the University of Campinas in Brazil. And she studies frogs called pumpkin toadlets from the cloud forests of coastal Brazil. They are extremely cool. 
Uh, they're teeny tiny. They're neon orange, and they wave their arms around when they feel threatened. By either a predator or a herpetologist. And true to frog form, they make this slow call that sounds like a cricket, uh, like. Ch -ch but here's the weird part. It appears the pumpkin toadlets are not able to hear the sounds they make. Goot and her colleagues played recordings of the calls to the frogs to look for reactions. The researchers also traced electrical impulses from the frogs' ears to their brains, and even dissected the frogs' inner ear. And it turns out the frogs just don't have the equipment to hear their own voices. The study's in the journal Scientific Reports. Why would they call if they cannot hear their own calls, right? Goot does have a few theories. Perhaps she says the bulging throat movement associated with calling is a sexual signal itself, with the sound an inadvertent accompaniment. Perhaps the frogs lost the ability to hear the calls at some point in their evolutionary history, when the displays did the job well enough on their own. After all, they are a highly visual species. They're out during the day, brightly colored, do the hand-waving thing. And pumpkin toadlets are the only species unable to hear themselves, at least as far as we know. The thing is, it was really hard to convince even some of the co-authors to do the experiments because they were like, why would you test their hearing if they're calling the, the hear? They must hear, right? So I think it's also uh, the way we're doing science. We're not actually testing this kind of obvious things. So maybe there are more examples out there, but we don't know any yet. One can only hope that future research proposals will get a fair hearing. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Take any square kilometer of Earth's surface. About once a year, an extraordinary event occurs in the sky directly above that patch of land or sea. The hefty nucleus of a heavy element slams into the top of Earth's atmosphere at close to the speed of light. Scientists have been unable to tell where exactly these particles come from, in part because their trajectories can be nudged by galactic magnetic fields. Another puzzle is how the particles reach such blistering speeds. Two theories dominate efforts to explain these mysteries. One posits that the particles mostly come from exploding stars and other high-energy phenomena in our galaxy. The other speculates that the particles are produced beyond our galaxy perhaps in the active cores of other galaxies surrounding the Milky Way. Now, a study in the journal Science supports that second notion. Amazingly, any of these ultra-high-energy cosmic rays has the kinetic energy of an apple falling from a tree to the ground. That means that Isaac Newton or you would definitely feel it hit your head. Luckily, that never happens. Instead, when these cosmic speed demons strike our atmosphere, they create a brief flash of light as well as high-altitude air showers of less energetic particles that harmlessly dissipate. In the new study, an international team of more than 400 researchers analyzed a dozen years' worth of these events. They used the Pierre Aguirre Observatory, a Rhode Island-sized array of telescopes and 1,600 particle detectors operating in western Argentina to record air showers from more than 30,000 ultra-high-energy cosmic rays. And it turns out that most of the particles appear to come from a broad, relatively galaxy-rich region of sky located about 90 degrees away from the Milky Way's center, which suggests that they arise in faraway galaxies, perhaps from spinning supermassive black holes, rather than from anywhere closer to home. What a long, strange trip they've made. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Lee Billings.